that link there and rate this talk, uh, either before or after. It's more convenient if you do it before. Just go ahead and give it five stars, and we'll just call that it. So uh, everyone who's been to one of my talks before knows that I like to give book recommendations at the beginning. Every single one of these books informs this talk and is very important for you to read, professionally speaking. The first one is called Refactoring by Martin Fowler. Who has heard of this book? This book especially is important for today. The idea behind this book is when you read it, you will discover a bunch of tips and techniques and tools on how to improve the quality of the code base that you're working with without changing the functionality of the code base that you're working with. So when you apply the techniques that you find in this book, the code base will become easier and easier to use without you necessarily adding features to it. It's a great, it's a great book. The second one is called Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture, also by Fowler and some other authors. Who's heard of this? Only a few. The, the great thing about this book, well, so here's the funny thing. When you read this book, you're gonna discover it's telling you how to do things you already know how to do. You're gonna recognize a lot of the things that this book describes to you. The great thing about this book is not the things it describes, it is that it gives us a vocabulary to use when talking about those things. So words like active record, table data gateway, model view controller, things like that, come out of this book. So we could say, if we wanted, that I have a class whose only job is to move data in and out of the database, and the class only talks to one table. We could say that, or we could say, I'm using a table data gateway. That's the power of using the vocabulary provided by this second book. The last one is called The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks. Anyone read it? Again, a few. Who has heard of something called Brooks' Law? Brooks' Law is the central essay of this book. Brooks' Law states, and this is important for today's talk, if you have a software project that is running late and you bring people on to help with it, bringing those people on is gonna, get, is gonna make it go more slowly, not faster. So as you add manpower, productivity decreases. He talks about why in this book. That is only one of the essays written here. It was written in 1975, and everything in here, except for the parts about COBOL, are also completely applicable today. So if you read this book, Mythical Man Month, you will know more about project management than any other three project managers you've met in your life, just from that one essay. So again, my name is Paul Jones. Uh, in a previous career, I used to get paid to be a spy. I spent year, eight years in US Air Force Operations Intelligence. Uh, I know that some folks in here are already going through their list of military intelligence jokes. Let's just assume that I've heard them. Uh, I've been programming since 1983 in one capacity or another. Uh, that means that if you were born after 1983, then I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. I'm not sure how I feel about that these days. Uh, I've been programming exclusively, in, in, almost exclusively, in PHP since 1999. In that time, I've been everything from a junior developer to a VP of engineering. Right now, I'm an architect at a place called Tandem. Uh, it's a startup out of Nashville. Uh, I've done a lot of open source work. The Aura Project, which is a collection of completely independent decoupled libraries. So if you download one, you just get that one library and not a bunch of other stuff. You can combine it into a framework if you want to. Uh, I was an original contributor to the Zend framework uh, code base, the ZendDB and Zend View portions. Uh, if you like that, those portions, uh, I'm happy. Uh, if you don't like them, I'm gonna say they ruined them after I left. Uh, I'm a, I was on the advisory board for the Zend certification exam. Who here has their Zend cert? A few, only a few. As someone who has done hiring before, I strongly recommend you get your Zen certification. We all know that certifications don't mean we're good programmers, but as an employer, it tells me that you, in your profession, have enough discipline to get a certification that you at least know the language that you're working with. So as someone who does hiring work, seeing a Zen certification on a resume makes it really easy for me to pick out the people who are serious and the people who aren't. Uh, I'm a voting member on the PHP Framework Interoperability Group. If you've heard of PSR 1 and 2, the coding standards, I'm the guy who was the driving force behind those. Uh, I was also the driving force, along with a guy named Bo Simonson, behind PSR 4, the new auto-loading standard. And finally, I am uh, working on a paper called Action Domain Responder, which is a refinement of Model View Controller. If that sounds interesting to you, you can either Google for that or you can come to my talk for it. Um, I talk about it tomorrow in this same time slot, although I'm not sure which room. So today we're gonna to be talking about uh, legacy code, the horrible, awful code base that you're stuck with right now, 
how we can begin working our way out of that code base so that our lives don't feel as horrible every time we go into work to have to deal with it. And then when we've made a couple of improvements, we'll see how our life has gotten better, but how there's still a lot of room left for improvement even after we've done these, these incremental improvements. So I always like to start out this talk with a story. And I think this is a story that everyone here is gonna be familiar with. You have just hired on at a new company. Uh, you've gone through the interviews, everyone loves you, you love them, everything's great, all the people you're working with are smart, they think you're a genius. The project is behind, and they need you to help them add features, get bugs fixed, so that it can get out, you know, in, in, uh, get out in a reasonable period of time. So you sit down, Monday, 9 o'clock, with the brand new Apple laptop they gave you, the two 27-inch screens, the Aeron chair, you know, everything's great. You sit down, you check out the code base. And five minutes later, you want to claw out your eyes because the thing is so horrifyingly awful to look at. It's architected so badly. Everything is page scripts, all sitting in the document root, so that people just browse the page scripts, and anytime you want to add something, you just add another script in the document root. Those page scripts are composed of a bunch of includes, so that every time you include something, some logic gets executed, and God only knows how many other includes are being included by the includes that got included. So every time you change something here, something else over here breaks because there's all these globals in these includes. You've got a, maybe you've got a bunch of functions, a bunch of class files, but they all have like global DB or global cache or global something else. So every time you try to fix something here, something else breaks. And then, because it, there's no unit tests, right? If there were unit tests, we'd probably have a much better situation. The only people whose, live is, whose lives are worse than yours are the people on the QA team, because you make a change and you don't know if anything else broke. So it goes to QA. They discovered that something else broke, and then they bring it back to you, and there's a new bug that's been entered. I see some heads nodding along here. So, you sit down, because you're a good employee, you want to do your work, you want to be loyal, you do your work, you're given a feature, you think it ought to take three or four days, and it takes you two weeks, right? So you go to the boss. You say, boss, look, I know that we need to be doing this stuff, but the code base is awful. I can't get my work done in a reasonable period of time. We need to stop what we're doing, back off for a little bit, get this code base a little more better organized so that I can do my work in a reasonable period of time, and then everything will be better, you know? I'll, I'll feel better about my life. I won't feel this dread and horror and terror every time I try to fix something. And the boss comes back to me and says, look, I know it's in bad shape. The last three people we hired on told us exactly the same thing. But the truth is, we don't have time on our schedule to fix the code base. The people that are paying us, whether they're venture capitalists or our customers, they're not paying us to make our own life better. They're paying us to fix the bugs. They're paying us to put out the features. That's why they're giving us the money. They don't care that our life sucks. They want their life to be better. So you argue back and forth about this. And again, you're a good employee. You realize the boss has a point. This is where the money is coming from. You gotta make them happy. So you go back, you sit down at your desk, and you crank up the next feature, which takes a month. And then at the end of that month, because the project is still late, they've hired, an, 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 they've hired on another developer. That developer comes in. Sits down, Monday, 9 o'clock, looks at the code base, half an hour later, gets up, walks out, you know he's talking with the manager. Comes back, sits down, he's had exactly the same conversation you had. The developer looks at you and says, how did the code base get to be this bad? And you look at that new developer and you say, truthfully, I don't know how it got to be this bad. It was like that when I got here. That sound familiar to everybody? So how did it get, this, get to be this bad in the first place? I'm going to assert there's two reasons. There's really, there's really one reason, but they're two sides of the same coin. They both deal with PHP as a language. The thing is, the great thing about PHP is that anyone can use it. If you are a non-technical person, maybe even not much of a programmer, and you have a business idea, maybe you know a little HTML, a little JavaScript, you can get someone to set up a server, you can slap out some code in PHP, connect it to a credit card system, and voila, you've got a business on, on the web, and you've got the money starts rolling in, you know, it's a great success, you know, it works. Then after a month or so, you realize, man, maybe there's some edge cases, maybe it's not scaling up the way it should, maybe there's some cross-site scripting or SQL injection vulnerabilities, and it goes from this great success of it works to, well, you know, it, it works. And the reason we have this transition is because this, the great thing about PHP is the same thing as the awful thing about PHP, and, and that is that anyone can use it. Non-professional programmers, not like us, right, get to put, can put together a really good business idea, and then send it out, and it'll work, but then you, as a professional programmer, when you come in to maintain it, when you look at this code base that was done by the non-professional, it's like looking at a dancing bear. The thing about a dancing bear is, when you're looking at it, 
you're not criticizing the bear for the fact that its pirouette is off balance, right? You're not looking at them and thinking maybe its plie is not fully, fully extended. You're just amazed the thing is dancing at all. The code bases are like, how did the code base ever work in the first place? How did it ever get written in such a way that anything ever worked? The person who wrote it, again, being a non-professional, they weren't thinking about long-term stuff. And this is why. They weren't thinking about architecture. They weren't thinking about the maintainability problems that would come up later. They certainly weren't thinking about automated testing. The reason is, again, these are non-professional folks. He writes, they, they write this thing, and then, because they're not a professional programmer, they get the business running, and then they move on to their next idea. And they leave behind this awful code base. And you, you poor bastard, you're the one that's stuck having to deal with the, the leftovers of all of this. So let's just take a look at some example code here. Can everyone see this from the back? So I've changed the names to protect the guilty, but this is, this is real code. So again, a typical script, bunch of requires right at the top. Okay, set some variables, app equals type equals organization. Is that a bug? Don't know. ID equals user get a dollar user. Where did dollar user come from? Anyone know? No one knows. Up here, so it had to be up here someplace. But which one? Was it one of these? Was it one of the, one, the files that these included? Okay, whatever. Owner name equals convert, convert. Is convert name a PHP function? Are you sure? There's like 4,000. So yeah, but where's this defined? You know, who knows? Okay, whatever. So we scroll how many page style page, dollar J equals quote dollar, what is this for? I mean, and I know the people who wrote this, and I asked them, they actually used this in some JavaScript later because they needed to like change the variable in the JavaScript from time to time. I, God only knows. All right, so, oh, there's some SQL, that's nice. We'll just do our SQL right in the page script, and then we'll do some manipulation of the SQL. Now, man, apparently we're doing dates or something. Oh, we'll set some right bar content, that's nice. Oh, no, we'll set some alternative right bar content in case, what was that condition up there? Ah, who cares? Scroll down, oh, there's some CSS embedded right in there. Isn't that nice? CSS and, wait, include header, what was that? Include header, I thought we were doing the header. No, now we're doing the header, okay. So more SQL, manipulate it some, more SQL, ton of HTML, user, the intro content, the main content, the bottom text, include the footer and exit. Exit. Why is there an exit right there? <laughs> what? <laughs> There's two pages here. If you go way back to the top, you see this original if? That's page one. And then everything under that is page two. I mean, who? Don't laugh, because you have all written this. Everyone here has done this at some point. But this is the kind of code base I'm talking about, right? This is the kind of thing we've got to deal with on a regular basis. And again, how did it get to be this bad? Again, the original developer, again, God love him, probably didn't know any better. Maybe not a professional, maybe very early in his programming career or her program clear, career. And then, because the business depends on this code, nobody wants to touch it too much. We want to leave it running. So the subsequent developers, they come in, they don't want to mess with it too much, they're going to work with what's there. We know it's horrible, we know it's awful, but we'll fix it later. We'll fix that later, yeah, this is bad, we can fix that. If it's taking two weeks to do three days worth of work, later has become now. It's time to start getting rid of this stuff and making our own lives better. Because the real horrible thing about this code is not the code. It's how we feel when we have to deal with it. We're scared to death to touch anything. It gives us the sense of dread to, to our daily work that we don't want to have. There's actually a name for this kind of situation. This is called technical debt. Who has heard the term technical debt before? For you, I won't do you the disservice of reading the slide for everyone else. The basic idea is technical debt is all of the things that you should have done that you didn't do. And, this is the key, in order to make it, in order to fix the thing that you should have done, it's not a question of making one change in one place. You have to make a series of coordinated changes across the code base in order to reduce one piece of technical debt, in order to fix one thing that, that was done wrong. Does everyone get that? So that's technical debt. So the situation we're in, being one of technical debt, in order to make our lives better, what do we do with debt? We pay it off, right? So how do we go about paying off this technical debt? Well, it's easiest to work by analogy here. It turns out that technical debt is a lot like financial debt. 
Here's the thing about financial debt. The running theme is that you get the thing first and then you pay for it later, but you pay for it with interest. Let's say you're a gamer. You want the newest, hottest console that comes out. It's $300, but you being a poor junior developer do not have $300 in cash, but you do have credit card. So you type in your credit card to Amazon or GameStop or wherever it is you get your console. They give you the console and then you eventually give them $300 plus a little more because of the interest. So it ends up being $400 or 450 over time. But again, the key is you get the console first, essentially for free, and then you pay it off over time. Same thing with a car. You want to buy a snazzy $30,000 car? You don't have $30,000, so you sign a car loan. And over four or five years, you pay them $45,000 for a $30,000 car. But you get the benefit of having the car during those four or five years. Same thing with a house. $300,000 house, you sign a mortgage, you end up paying $600,000 over 20 years or 30 years, but you get the joy of having the house in the first place. The features that we have got on technical debt are the same way. All these features that, we've, that, we've, that have been put together were bought on debt. We cut some corners, we didn't write the test, we got it out quickly but now you gotta pay in terms of having to deal with this awful code base. So the funny thing about most of the technical debt that probably everyone in this room is dealing with is that it is not debt of their own choosing. Because we, as professionals, who know that we're gonna have to deal with the code that we write, we're totally happy to pay for our features in cash. If a feature we think is gonna take two or three days to do it, you know, cut corners, but it'll take five or six days to do it, you know, quote, quote, the right way, we are totally happy to do it the right way, to spend the five or six days, because we know we're gonna to have to come back to this later. But that's not the situation we're in right now. We have inherited someone else's technical debt. So we're suffering on a daily basis with choices that we didn't make, things that we have inherited. But here's the key to getting out of this. We can either continue to suffer the way things are now, under the, the owner, under, under the, uh, the burden of choices that we didn't make, or, and this is the key. We can choose to suffer in a different way. We can choose to do additional or different work that, although it is extra trouble now, will end up leading us on a path of change, a path of growth that will allow us to feel better about our work life over time. Does everyone get what I'm saying there? Essentially, this is the way you pay off any other debt, right? So, there's all this talk about suffering. Suffering is depressing. There are other ways of dealing with technical debt. We can just declare bankruptcy, right? We can just look at the code base and nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Rewrite it from scratch, right? Here's the problem. No, de no developer ever looked at any code and said, this code is fine, it doesn't need to be rewritten. This is always our first instinct because it's sexy. We get to use the hottest new framework if we re rewrite it from scratch. We get to use domain-driven design and do all the right, you know, whatever the latest hottest buzzword is for what we're doing. We get to be our own customers. We get to write it the way we want to write it, the way we think is right. Very tempting. I strongly urge you to resist this temptation. Again, it's really sexy, but I'm gonna try and make a business case here in terms of why a rewrite is 99% of the time, not what you want to do. Occasionally, maybe once, but that's, again, because it's our default position to rewrite, we need to stay away from it as, our, as, a, as a response. So first of all, if we do a rewrite, it's never quite as simple as you think it's gonna be. The first problem is that if you take the developers that you've got now and have, start them on a rewrite, the developers are not gonna be doing any work on the old project. That means the old project bugs don't get fixed. The features don't get added. New customers, seeing that it's still in its old state, don't come in. The existing customers, not getting their bugs fixed, leave. So you're expending a lot of effort while not earning any additional revenue from the project. Now if you think you can get away with doing, even if you think you can get away with doing that, one, or one of the things that makes people think they can get away with doing this anyway, is they say, all right, tell you what, we know that we'll be expending this additional effort, we've got additional money, we'll just hire extra developers. We'll hire new developers, we'll put them on the new project, the new rewrite, and we'll leave the old developers on the existing project, and they will fix bugs and add features. So here's the problem, we're back to the mythical man month. The problem is one of communication and knowledge. When you hire these new developers, they know zero about your business. They know nothing about the bugs that exist in the old system, they know nothing about how the features are supposed to work. All of that embedded knowledge that's in the old code base and in the minds of the, old, of the existing developers None of that exists for the new developers. The new developers have to have that information in order to do their job, so what do they do? They take up all the time of the old developers, asking them questions. So the old developers, the existing developers, their productivity drops to zero, 
And the new developers never had any productivity anyway. So by doubling your workforce, you have now halved your productivity. That's the best case scenario. All right, okay, so we won't do that. We'll hire new folks, but we'll put the new folks on the old system, and the people that we have, we'll have them do the rewrite, because they know the most about the system, right? Same problem. The new developers that you bring in, working on the old system, don't know any of the history, they don't know why the bugs are there, they have to be trained up a lot. How are they gonna get that information? They're gonna ask the existing developers. You've just halved your productivity again. All right, so let's say we're totally willing to deal with that. We're willing to deal with the cost, we're willing to deal with the knowledge transfer problem, and the additional time that it's gonna take. Well, here's the problem. Not only is it gonna take a lot more time, it's gonna take a lot more time than you think it will. Who here has heard of something called Hofstetter's Law? Ho one or two, eternal golden braid. Um, Hofstetter's Law states that it always takes longer than you think it will, even when you take Hofstetter's Law into account. So the variation on this is, how do we estimate how long a rewrite is gonna take? Who here has a favorite? We all have our favorite estimation techniques, right? You, you do your estimate, and then, the man, then you as the developer add some padding, and you give it to the manager, and the matter, manager adds some padding, and then it goes, you know, goes up the chain like that. For something like this, here's the proper estimation technique. Whatever estimation technique you're using right now, go ahead and use it, then double it, and then convert it to the next higher unit. So if you think it's gonna be a two month rewrite, it's really gonna be four years. You think I'm, I'm exaggerating, but not by much. Some people, ask Netscape, ask, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, ask Netscape how long it took them to rewrite into Mozilla. They went out of business. So this is not where you wanna be. Okay, let's just say we're totally willing to accept the length of a rewrite. When you, and, and, you've, and you haven't estimated properly. So now, you're six months into it, which you thought was gonna be a two month rewrite, and it's taking a lot longer than you thought it would. You start cutting corners again, you start not writing your unit tests, and you end up with a second system that has a different bad architecture than the first system. So now you've got two systems. Both of them are equally horrible, and you're in a worse off position than you were because you've lost money, you've lost time. This is not where we wanna be. Instead of declaring bankruptcy, instead of nuking the thing from orbit, in order to get yourself in a better position in a reasonable way, I strongly suggest the incremental approach, approach instead. With the incremental approach, instead of waiting months and months and months to see the effects of a change that we have made, instead of doing that, we make one change, a very small one, on the existing code base, and then we make another one, and then we make another one, and over time, these small changes end up building into a really huge quality improvement, both of the code and of your quality of life. Because then the key here is not the technology per se. The fact is that we feel horrible when we're working on this stuff. We wanna feel like we're moving forward, like we're getting some benefit of having been here. So when we pay off the smallest, again, it's like paying off a credit card, right? You pay off the smallest credit card, then the next one, the next one, you snowball all the way through that. We build up some inertia not just in terms of our patterns and the habits and how we work, but in how we feel about the work that we're doing. If you can make a small change and see a small improvement today, and then another one tomorrow, and another one tomorrow, or the day after that, in a month, you're gonna be feeling really good about the system, and the system will have actually improved. So, we make small changes across the code base, the changes build on each other, and then it improves over time. Does everyone get where I'm coming from here? Now, here's the problem, a rewrite, Sounds really sexy, you know, it's really tempting. This sounds a lot like actual work. But here's the thing, it has the benefit of actually working. So if we do this, we gotta keep some goals in mind. Goal number zero, because we're developers, right? We count from zero. Goal number zero is we always keep the application running the whole time. At no point are we gonna make a change that keeps us from making money. So that's the first thing. Then we're gonna do two things, just two, two sets of changes. The first one is we're gonna consolidate all of the classes in the system, and incidentally all of the functions in the system, into a single central location so they can be auto-loaded, and we can start removing these include statements that are scattered everywhere, at least removing some of them. We're gonna use something called PSR0 for that, we'll talk about that in a moment. Once we've done that, we're gonna convert all of the uses of globals throughout, the, throughout these classes that we've extracted, we're gonna convert all of those to use injected dependencies instead of globals. Again, I'll talk about that in some detail as well. But here's the mantra we need to remember while we're doing these changes. First of all, one small change. Do not make a bunch of changes all at once. 
Because if you do that and you come back and try to see what went wrong, it'll be hard for you to figure out which change it was that busted things. So make one change, one small change. After that, you spot check the system to make sure it's still working. I'll talk about that in a moment. You commit it, you push it, send it off to QA, you go back and you make your next small change. Did everyone get what I'm talking about there? So when I say spot check, I used to say test it, then people thought I meant unit testing. This is not what I mean by unit, I mean, if you've got unit tests, that's awesome. That's probably not the situation you're in right now. When I say spot check, I mean something like what are called characterization tests. Who's heard of characterization tests before? I'm assuming the people who read the Feathers book as well then. Uh, the idea behind a characterization test is, actually let me back up. A unit test tests a method in a class. A characterization test tests the output of the system. So the spot check, the way this works is, let's say you're gonna go change something on a particular page. You get the output of the page, then you make your change, and you get the output of the page again. If it's the same, then your spot check has succeeded. If it's different, something is wrong, something's broken, you need to go back and fix it so that the, the output after looks as the same as the output before. That's it, that's all a spot check is. So this is the mantra, we make one small change, we spot check it, we commit it to revision control. We're all using revision control, right? Commit it, push it, send it off to QA. If you have a QA team, if it's you, then you're already done. Questions on that? Okay. Let's get started with our first change. The first thing we're gonna do, gonna do is we're gonna consolidate all of our classes for auto-loading. Who here is not using auto-loading right now? Only one or two, that's excellent. Okay, so this is gonna be, I'm gonna keep this very short. The, the, uh, the idea is that instead of having to include a class definition before you use the class, you give PHP a little bit of code that tells it where to look for classes. So that instead of you having to include it and then do a new, you can just say, give me a new example name. PHP figures out, oh, that class isn't defined yet. I'll go to my autoloader, I'll find the class, and then I'll load up the definition, and then I will run this line. That's all autoloading does for you. And again, because we've, everyone here appears to be using it, I'm gonna recommend using PSR0 because we're talking about legacy code bases. PSR0 is a transitional, uh, a transitional recommendation from PHP 5.1 and 2 to PHP 5.3, so it was written before formal namespaces. It was written just as formal namespaces started coming out. It is a, uh, a codification of the old horde and pair class to file naming convention, if you've heard of that. The idea is that in any given class name, the namespace separators will map to directory separators in the file system. The, any underscores in the final class name portion also map to directory separators in the, in, the, uh, in the file system. Again, this second part is because previously under horde and pair, uh, we didn't have formal namespaces, so we used underscores as sort of a pseudo namespace separator, so that, is a, a, uh, that harkens back to that, makes allowance for it. Uh, so that if you have a, a class called foo bar baz, then it maps to a file path foo slash bar slash baz dot php. Here's another example. Vendor, notice that the, under, that the uh, namespace separators here and here map to uh, directory separators. The underscores in the namespace stay the same, but in the class name portion, they also get converted to directory separators. So that's a little tricky. If you're on PHP 5.3 now, and, you have, and you're using formal namespaces, and you're not using underscores in your class names, I would recommend using PSR4 instead. We can talk about that afterwards if you like. But again, because we're talking about legacy stuff, it's unlike, I think it's probably unlikely that you're, you're in that kind of situation. So that's all PSR0 is. It's a description of how to do this. Here's some code for an autoloader that works for PSR0. Uh, the short, again, we just look at the, the namespace, the top part is look at the namespace portion, replace namespace separators with direct, directory separators, look at the class name portion, replace underscores with directory separators, tag, p, tab, uh, uh, attach p, dot PHP onto the end. But then this is the key right here. We've got this base directory. The idea is we're going to have a single central base directory from or in which we're going to place all of the classes in the entire system. So instead of them being scattered in lots of different places, we're gonna bring them all into this one base directory and then they will self-segregate uh, uh, self based on their class names getting converted to directories. So everyone see what's going on there? Okay. And then you register it with SPL and it'll run this every time you, you ask for a class that isn't defined yet. So then, we, so once we have written this autoloader, we've put it in a setup file or somewhere that gets loaded early on, in the, early on in the execution path, we then begin looking through the system to find classes and moving them to that central, that central location. So for every class that we find, we find the file for it, 
we move the file to the central location according to the PSR0 naming rules. And then every time that class is used throughout, this, every time we see an include for that file in the system, we remove that include. So we move the class, we remove all the includes that reference that class definition. That's our one step. Spot check it, commit it, push it, send it off to QA. You've now successfully moved one class and gotten, then this is the point here, gotten rid of the include statement that loads up that class. By the end of this process, we will have removed all of the include statements that only load up definitions. That means the only include statements that, we, that remain are the includes that are executing logic. We will be able to see the flow of the application much more clearly once those additional include, once those definitional include statements are removed. Everyone get what's going on there? So this is gonna help clarify, it's gonna remove code for one, and it's gonna make the code that remains more clear to us as to what's going on. So there are lots of details that go along with this. If you have, uh, again, you've got class files in several paths, removing all the central location. If you have uh, more than one class profile, let's say you've got one file with three classes defined in it, the PSR0 rules pretty much, I'm not gonna say require, but they, they hinge on uh, you having only one class per file. So if you've got three classes in one file, that's easy. Cut out the first class, put it in its own file, name it for the PSR0 convention. Same thing with the other two classes. So just split them up into their own files. That's it. Uh, if you have classes that are defined inline in a page script, probably because they're only used by that page script, that's cool. Cut, highlight it, cut it out, put it in its own file, put the file in the base log in the uh, central class directory, named under according to the PSR0 rules, and then remove the include statement. For, oh, well, that one wouldn't have an include statement. But again, continue to remove the include statements as you go. Finally, uh, you're gonna notice that in some cases, this is not, this doesn't happen often, but sometimes, you've got execution path A that defines a class called, say, user, and you've got execution path B that also defines a class called user, but those two never get defined at the same, because they're not in the same execution path. So when you pull out the first user and put it in the central directory, it's gonna be cool, but when you try to pull out that second one, well, now you've got two classes named user, they're gonna conflict with each other. It's okay to change the names. Change the so called the first one user one and the second one user two or something that makes sense for that class in that execution path. Questions on any of that before I continue? Right. Unfortunately, uh, most legacy code, lots of legacy code bases, mm -hmm. are not class oriented in any way. They are primarily procedural. They have tons of functions sitting in the global namespace. Anyone dealing with this on a? Quite a few. So here's the problem. Auto loading only works with classes. It does not work with function definitions. There's a way around this so that we can start getting rid of the includes for those function definitions as well, and that is to wrap those functions in classes and make them either static methods or instance methods on a class. Now right now, the people who love procedural programming are like, I hate object-oriented programming. I don't want to do that. I'm not trying to make you in an object-oriented kind of person. I'm trying to make you in an auto-loading kind of person. This will allow you to get to the auto-loading, and it will change very little else about how you're doing the work. So once we have wrapped those functions and classes, we can move those classes to the central class directory. Then we can change the calls that used to be these global functions. We now make them as static calls to these classes that we've just created, and, uh, and then continue to remove the include and require statements as we go. Again, the point here is to make it so that we're removing as much code as we can so that we can see what's left behind more clearly. We'll go over this process in a little bit of detail. So let's say we've got this original function called fetch results. Three lines of code, glo ugh, global dollar DB. We'll deal with the global in a minute. But the point is we're using the DB connection to fetch whatever results we're gonna fetch and then return those results. And when we call it, we say results equals fetch results, right? So to convert this, all you need to do is take that function file as it is, put a class, a class declaration at the top and a closing embrace at the bottom, and put public static in front, of, in front of every function that's in that file. That's it, now I have modified the, uh, the function name here to make it PSR2 compliant. That's purely aesthetic, you don't have to do that. But notice that the code is now exactly the same. All we've got now is a static method on a class. So now to call this, instead of doing uh, fetch results like we did before, instead of doing that, we just put example double colon in front of what used to be the old function name. So this is easiest to do one file at a time, a, file's worth, uh, a function file worth at a time, wrap it in a class, and then change all the, the invocations throughout the code base. 
then do your spot check, and so on. You may want to do it function by function, depending on, uh, depending on how your code base is set up. That's how you set it up as a static method. Questions there? Then this gets auto-loaded. You don't need to include that function definition file anymore. Now this is good. There's nothing wrong with doing static methods. I personally prefer instance methods. Uh, later on in this, develop, in this refactoring process, instance methods are going to be a lot more useful to you because you're going to be able to inject dependencies easier. Uh, but it is a little extra work. First of all, instead of declaring it as public static, you just declare it as public. Then you have to do two changes in the code base. Every time you call fetch results, you have to create a new example instance and then call the method off that instance. So there's a little extra work there. This comes back, this turns out to be really useful when you're testing, but you don't necessarily have to do this right away. If you want to, you can start out by converting everything to static methods in, in one series of passes. And then later on, if you want to, convert the static methods to instance methods when it is suitable. Does everyone see what's going on there? Again, the beautiful thing about this is we no longer have to include that function file anymore. We can let the autoloader grab the example class for us, and then all of those methods become available off that class. So that is step one, is consolidating all of the classes and functions to a single, centra, single central location for autoloading. No questions on any of that? All right. So now we've consolidated all these classes and functions. They're all in a single central location. They're where we can see them very easily. We're now going to go through all of those class methods and convert every use of globals to using injected dependencies. So to tell you how we get there from here, this is generally a naive way of how people start out. Let's say we've got this example class. We know we need to fetch some results. We know we need a database connection to do it. The first thing you do, you know, brand new developer, day one, is oh, I need a new database connection. So new database connection with my username and password. And then I'll return the fetch results, whatever. So there's problems with this, obviously. The first time you do this, this is great. The second time you need to do it, you realize that this is really not a good use of our resources. First of all, every time we call that method, it makes a new database connection, which sucks. If you need to do a database connection in 50 different places, that means you need to copy that code in 50 different places, and that's 50 different connections that get made every time you make a call. That sucks too, it's poor use of resources. Finally, if you ever need to change the username and password, you've got to change it in 50 different places. So this is clearly not the way we want to go. This is where you start out, but this is not the right solution. So, you're a good developer, you know the PHP manual exists, you go to php.net, and you discover the global keyword. The global keyword says that I can create a, uh, a function, or I can create a, var a variable in a setup file or somewhere in the global namespace. And then anytime I need it, I can just say global DB and it will drag it in my, into the current scope for me. And then I can use it. Solution, right? We've got one connection. We can share it across everything. We only have to change our username and password in one place, right? This is it. We're done. No. So here's the problem. The quantum people have something they call spooky action at a distance. Because this global is shared, that means any time you change it anywhere in one place, it changes everywhere else instantaneously. So if you have someone that unsets that database connection in one of their functions, guess what? No more database connection. Good luck tracking that bug down. Or if they set it to a different value, or if they change the connection out from under you. Tons of problems here. So how do we get away from this? The way we get away from this is we want to convert away from the idea of dragging in our dependencies from the outside to pushing them down into it from the outside. This is called dependency injection. Again, I'm not, who's heard, who has heard of, first, who's heard, who's heard of this term? Good. I'm not, for the rest of you, I'm not talking about dependency injection containers. I'm talking about dependency injection as a technique, as a process. So the idea is, again, instead of reaching out from the inside of a function and dragging in what we need, we start on the outside of the function, create everything that it needs, and then feed it into the function from the outside. That's it. That's all dependency injection is. But let's see how that works with that, exam that fetch results method that I was talking about before. So we've got our class example with this global DB. This is our starting point. So we've got to do this in a couple of steps. And this, incidentally, is where using instance methods rather than static methods turns out to save us. Because we're going to do this in two steps. The first thing we do is a public function results where we had the global DB, we move the global DB to the constructor, and then we retain it as a parameter. That's one change. You commit, you make this change, you spot check it, you commit it, you push it, send it off to QA. Because if this works, we're good. Now, if you wanted to, you could stop right here. Things are already better for you. 
because now you've got, all, if there's like 52 globals in the, the rest of the class, they're not all in one place, they're all properties. It's becoming a lot easier to understand what's going on already. So then the second step in this to finish it off is to remove that global DB from the constructor and put it into the, as a constructor parameter so that it has to get passed in from the outside anytime we create the example class. Now it's currently, and it's already retained as a property, and this is already using the property down here. So there's a change. We're not done. Now the problem is, when we create the example class, we need to pass in a database connection every time. So once you make this change, you then need to go back to the rest of the code base, look for every instance of new example, and create a database connection first, and then pass it into the example class when you create the example class. Test it, spot check it, commit it, push it, send it off to QA. Do that with one class, the next one, the next one. Eventually you end up removing all of your globals in that way. So here's the problem. When we change the instantiation calls, we're gonna realize that some of the dependencies have dependencies. So there's these intermediary steps that we may have to go through in order to get all the dependencies created on the outside and pushed down in. So let me show you what that looks like. Let's say we've got this example class with its fetch results and it would start out with having global DB. Then we additionally have the service class. The service class says, I'm gonna create a new example class and I'm gonna use the example class to fetch my results. And because everything is globals here, we don't need, we're not passing anything in. So this calls new example, new example uses global DB to fetch the results. But then we do the thing where we, cha where we change example to use dependency injection. So that's our finished version of example using dependency injection. Down here though, it turns out for us to create this new example, we need the database connection. So now when we create the service, we need to pass in the database connection that action needs to create the example. Everyone see what's going on there? This is actually a violation of something called the law of Demeter. This is perfectly fine as an intermediary state. You're gonna discover a lot of classes that have to work this way. What you wanna end up doing, though, just as an exercise, does the service class actually need the database connection? No. What needs the, service, what needs the database connection is the example class. So the solution here is, anytime you have an intermediary dependency of this sort, is to figure out what's actually necessary and pass in the final dependency, not the intermediary one. So the service class doesn't need a database connection. What it needs is an example instance. So we pass in the example instance from the outside and then we say example fetch results. Now this ends up with a little more code on the outside of the classes rather than being on the inside of the classes. So we've gone through this progression of instantiation of the service, of the service object. First of all, the top, service equals new service, and it's all globals all the time. Easy, right? Totally simple. What are the dependencies there? What does the service class need in order to operate? How many other parts of the system does it, does it touch? How can you tell? You can't. This looks simple, but it's actually masking a lot of complexity. This is part of what's making our life hard. So then what we do is we go to our, our intermediary dependency, where we create the database connection, we pass the database connection to the service, so the service can create the example of the database connection. So this is the interim state. And again, you do this, you're totally fine. You can wait until your next iteration to, to come back to this. This is an improvement over that. The goal in all of this is not perfection in any one step, it's merely to improve things. So this is an improvement over that, but this, this is the final state we wanna reach, where we create our database connection, we feed it to the example, and we feed the example to the service. Now, this is literally three times as much code, right? So why would you do this? For clarity. The whole point here is, whereas at the top, you had no idea what was interacting with what, what does service need in order to work now? You, you, you can tell immediately exactly what it needs, and, you can, and it, 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 the complexity is not gone. The complexity has been exposed. And this is gonna make it a lot easier for you to figure out what's going on, especially when you start building your tasks. Questions on any of that? Some people tilting heads? We can talk about it afterwards if you like. That's two things. We have consolidated our classes and functions into a single place for auto-loading. And we've gotten rid of our globals. We're using dependency injection now. And we've kept goal zero in mind the whole time. The application never stopped running. We didn't have to do all of that in one pass. 
we can spend an hour every night, if we feel like it, making some improvements, committing them, pushing them, sending them off to QA, come back the next day, spend another extra hour if we feel like it. And over the course of two or three or four weeks, by spending one hour a day, half an hour a day, one day a week, improving the quality of the code base. This is the additional work, the additional suffering that leads to growth, that leads to change. By the time you do this, you're gonna have paid off a ton of technical, just from those two things. You're gonna have paid off a ton of technical debt. It will have revealed a lot of the system to you in doing so. You've also given yourself an organizational structure for all new work that you're going to be doing. If you ever need to add new functionality, where does it go? It goes in the central classes directory as a new class or a new method on a class. And then, because we've got this standard centralized way of doing things, everyone's decisions are gonna look the same. Every developer on the team knows exactly where things need to go. They'll go in the classes directory. And then they can start writing unit tests for them. We are writing our unit tests, right? Because if you don't, Chris Hartis is gonna come find you. Who knows the grumpy programmer? Not enough people. Oh, you, oh, I'm disappointed. So grumpy programmer on Twitter, write your tasks. It's a non-negotiable aspect. And this is gonna make it a lot easier for you to do, especially once the globals are gone. That used to be the end of the talk. Uh, the first time that I gave this presentation, uh, it was well received. Second time I gave it, well received. Third time I gave it, some people came back to me who had seen it the first time. They said, we did it. We removed, we consolidated all our classes. We removed the globals. We even removed all the super globals. What do we do now? I mean, we know there, there, there's more to be done because our life's just, you know, the program, the, the system still sucks. Well, it turns out I've done this a, a dozen different times. Took a bunch of notes. This is the follow-on process for all of this, and each of these is involved in its own way. But in general, this is what happens. After you've removed the globals, you then start removing the new keyword. And right now you're thinking, how do you live without the new keyword? Here's the thing. We all know about separation of concerns. You want to keep your models and your views and your controllers separated. But there is a guy named Mishko Hevery out at Google who claims that object creation is a concern that should be separated from object use. And after having done things his way for a little bit, I am convinced of the validity of that opinion. So the idea here is, instead of using new mixed in with your classes, you extract all uses of the word new and put them off into their own classes called factory classes. So that every class in your system now has only one of two jobs. Either it creates and returns objects, and that's all it does, or it operates on objects that have already been created. So that's the next step is to convert everything to factories. Then after that, we start removing all of our embedded SQL statements. We've got a bunch of SQL scattered throughout the system. We're gonna consolidate it into gateway classes so that anytime we need to do an SQL interaction, we no longer write SQL in line, we call a method. And anytime we need, new add, we need to add new SQL interactions, we add a new method on one of these gateway classes. This has the benefit of making our SQL code independently testable from the rest of the system. You're gonna notice that's a running theme. Then you're gonna notice that although we've removed the SQL, the stuff that manipulates the data, the core of our application logic, is still scattered in a lot of different places. So we're gonna begin by, we're gonna extract all the domain logic into transaction scripts. The name transaction script is a word that is a, is a vocabulary term from uh, the, the Fowler book that I mentioned earlier. So we're gonna pull out all our domain logic into its own layer. That will become independently testable, even independently testable from the SQL. So we can feed it whatever data we want in whatever edge cases we feel like and, see, and make sure it works. And then we're gonna notice that our presentation logic is still embedded. So all of our response work, the presentation, the headers, all that stuff is still mixed in. We'll extract that to its own layer. Then we're gonna be, and when you have done this, all of those page scripts that we had, that one at the beginning that's like 300 lines long, it's not gonna be 50 lines long. The only thing that's gonna be left in it is the, is the logic to include a setup file, create the objects that are needed for these, and then perform some actions on them. So now we can extract that action logic too and put it into controller classes or action classes. Then we're gonna be down to like next to nothing. We're gonna, there may still be a lot of include calls left. We'll get rid of those, we'll put them in their own class methods. Then we're gonna set up a router and a front controller that point to our page script so we can decouple the page scripts from the file system. And then finally, we're gonna take the remaining code that lives in the page scripts and make those object creation routines in a dependency injection container. And at that point, we'll have fully modernized our system. Here's the problem. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of detail. That's more than I can talk about in an hour. It turns out it's more than I can talk about in three hours because I did a tutorial on this and it ran, ran way along. Uh, so to remedy that, 
to take all my, all my notes into consideration. Uh, I've written a book called Modernizing Legacy Applications of PHP. Uh, you remember we started out with the idea of this page-based, include-oriented, global spaghetti include mess of code. When you apply the steps from this talk that are outlined in this book, and the other steps that I, that I gave a brief overview just, just a moment ago, you will go from that mess to something that is auto-loaded, dependency injected, unit tested, layer separated, and front controlled. You will have a fully modernized application. Now, I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be easy. This requires effort and time and attention to detail. But at the end of the process, you will have a much better code base and you will feel much better about your working life. Again, that's really the key here. The technology is not the big point. The big point is we want to be happy about the work we're doing. This will help get us to that situation. Now, at the end of this, again, you will not have a perfect system. You will not have zero problems when you're done here. What you will have done is you will have traded the low quality problems of a legacy code base for the high quality problems of modern code base, one where you can start refactoring properly and organizing things in a much better way. Uh, if you want to go out and purchase it, you can get 10% off by using this coupon here. And it's uh, a money back guarantee. So if you get it, you don't like it, uh, you get your money back. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time.